Hey guys, I'm Gaspachian. You've seen me risk the lives of innocent civilians, it's only going to get worse from here. Because both we and the tourists are getting bored with our mere suborbital ventures, and it's decided that perhaps it is time to have another go at getting that 360 perspective of our home planet again. Thus far, the longest stay in space by a Kerbal lasted barely an hour. It is believed we can do far better than that, even without redesigning our launch vehicle. And this time, we want to have a look at every nook and cranny of the oblate spheroid that we are putting in so much work towards leaving behind. Strapped into the Mark I crew pod aboard our second Hugen 1 launch vehicle, we find Michael Larsen, a Danish national appearing way more eager to follow suit after others' successful flight. Perhaps he is feeling more secure knowing for sure a trip to space does not mean sudden death. Perhaps he's just afraid his bosses may have rigged the pod with surveillance equipment and feels the need to put on a brave face to not lose his next paycheck. No matter the cause for his apparent bravery, he is headed in another direction entirely to that which Other took July 14th earlier this year. Perhaps he feels that Due East is a heading forever cursed with the taint of cowardice associated not only with the previous launch by his colleague, but also with the storming of the Bastille Saint Antoine exactly 169 years prior to that first manned launch of our space program. No one else in this space program really knows what his angry mumbling of Le Francais and Révolution means, but the psychological evaluators tells it as it's probably just some internalized fanfiction of his. Whatever France may be, it's not something he'll likely spot from orbit around Kerbin. No. The reason to head north on this launch is neither a need to overcompensate for his personal self-esteem and sanity issues, nor is it done just to attempt something different to what Alder achieved on her flight nearly two months prior. Instead, the main reason we're going for a polar orbit on this endurance mission is to be sure to hit every biome available to us in low space. For each biome, there will be one unique crew report available to us, and Otter's flight is sure to have missed a bunch of those. Now, some of you are questioning that statement, thinking that I got things mixed up, and that I'm really talking about EVA reports when I said crew reports. But remember, we're playing with the SETI overhaul here, which very importantly, amongst other things, rebalances the science experiments available to us. This means neat things, such as sample returns only having to be performed once from a destination to get the full value, full transmission value for basic experiments, and of course a switch between the situation definitions for EVA and crew reports. This means we can get at nearly all the science from low carbon orbit without needing to upgrade our astronaut complex to allow for EVAs. Which is great, considering how little cash we've got on hand and how much of that we're planning on spending. But all of that is a moot point if we can't put Michael into an orbit to begin with, which is always a concern. During Other's flight, we expended a minimum of fuel by going for a very shallow launch profile. We of course also saved a lot of fuel by launching due east along the direction of planetary rotation. Launching prograde to that motion on our Kerbin 6.4 times as large as stock and with a rotational period of 24 hours will add 279 meters per second to your velocity at the equator and about 245 meters per second from our inclined launch site. With others flight we had about 400 meters per second to spare, which should mean that for a polar launch where we go get no prograde boost from the planet's rotation we should have a margin of about 150 meters per second of delta V, give or take. But again, that launch was an incredibly efficient one, which does not seem to be the case for our current venture. Alright, who am I kidding? Of course we're going to make it into orbit, and we've got almost four units of liquid fuel to spare. I never worried, and Michael wants everyone to know that he didn't either. With the launch out of the way, it's time to start worrying instead about our two favorite things, science and snacks. <laughs> 
we're going to make Michael stay up alone in space for 72 hours, which is comparable to the real world record for the longest solo space flight held by Valery Bukovsky since his flight aboard the Vostok 5 in 1963. He completed 82 orbits around the world in 4 days, 23 hours and 7 minutes. Which is something we're not going to beat this time, lest we'd like Michael to try some extreme dieting and record-breaking breath-holding. Besides, Spikovsky was not entirely alone up there, as Vostok 6 was launched two days after Vostok 5, and the two craft performed a rendezvous and made ra radio contact with one another. That was the first and only flight of the first female cosmonaut as well, as the first civilian spacefarer, Valentina Tereshkova. She did offer to go on a one-way trip to Mars in 2013, so it may be too early to write Vostok 6 off as her last flight yet. Sure, she's 79 years today, but all anyone really needs to do anything is some willpower and political backing. But trying to beat the endurance record set by Bukowski would inevitably lead to bad PR after the inevitable failure of such an attempt. Instead, We'll make sure to collect and transmit all those precious reports anytime we're connected to the KC, which as you can see is very intermittent as soon as we're out of plane with the MUN and our comms network. How are we going to relay our state-controlled propaganda that France does not exist to Michael if we can't stay in touch with him for prolonged durations? It's clear we need some other solution to that problem, especially with our planned unmanned moon landings to come. But back to the mission at hand, where it seems like we've found all the signs waiting for us near Kerbin, we've waited for 72 hours in orbit, and it's time to re return safely to the surface. Some effort is put into trying to land on the ice cap, since that's some science we're unlikely to get at without a conscious effort on our part. It turns out that we undershoot, but still, we complete the mission and get some more precious science. Next on our to-do list is to make those MUN landings happen, but for that to happen we like two things, comms and funds. To get at the funds issue, we'll keep doing tourism missions as they are offered to us. As our reputation has increased, so has the requirements of the offered contracts. Our paying customers are no longer satisfied with the suborbital joyrides and instead demand to be taken all the way into orbit. If we are to turn a profit from these missions, we need to design a low cost alternative to the Hugen 1 dedicated to tourism missions. There are plenty of items we can spare if we decide to keep mission times to a minimum, such as durable life support. Science experiments have also been rendered pointless since we've collected all requisite data we're ever likely to encounter or be able to collect on these missions. All told, we lower the cost of the launcher to about 36,000 kerbucks, some of which will be refunded from recovery of the first stage. The launcher we've designed is named the Wrist after one of the many named Valkyries from Norse myth. She is the first mentioned Valkyrie in the poem Grimnismal, and her name means Shaker. The Valkyries were, as some of you may know, beings, or fair warrior maidens to be precise, believed to bring fallen warriors to the hall of Valhalla, where the heroes would feast by Odin's side until the end of the world, Ragnarok. Here, we instead let the Valkyries bring tourists to their desired destinations, making no promises of either great feasts, fair maidens or one-eyed gods. Thus far, we've been slacking on the naming conventions in this space program, often opting for crew designations describing purpose rather than unleashing our inner poets. As appropriate a name as Monshot One, maybe, it's hardly a name I'd call imaginative nor beautiful. The Hugen orbital vehicle was one of the first vessels to break this boring pattern, of course named after one of the two ravens in the employ of Odin, through which he saw all. Appropriately, that vessel allowed us our Kerbals to observe all of their home planet for the first time. It is our hopes that Rist will not in similar poetic fashion bring our tourists to the afterlife. <laughs> 
rather back home in one piece. Now, when a contract requires an orbit and doesn't specify how long we are to stay in it, we're of course only going to get up to orbital speeds and then immediately drop out of the orbit and recover our vessel. This flight plan has several nice things going for it. First of all, we don't have to pack much battery capacity or any solar panels, since we only need the craft to function properly for less than 20 minutes. Secondly, short duration in-game means it's also quick to perform in real life, letting me get to the more interesting missions sooner. Showcased here are the two first orbital tourism missions conducted out of many, but they all follow a very basic pattern and are not very interesting to observe in and of themselves. Hopefully someone briefed the gentlemen Eriksson and Pedersen on the terms and conditions so we can avoid the lawsuit down the line when they say, hey, we didn't complete an orbit. The one thing to worry about with our budget design is that we by design have no connectivity to the craft after we've dumped the service module, meaning we by that point need to have activated the chutes and pointed ourselves retrograde in preparation for re-entry. I may have failed to fully prepare before separation on one occasion, where instead of eating the cost of failure, went for a reload. I guess I at that time argued that the space program I am running would have multiple people going through rigid protocols and procedures for bringing people home alive and safe. For these first few flights however, no such mishaps did happen, and I will not force you to sit through the umptillion successful flights and one mistake I did make with this design. But those umptillion and one flights did earn our space program enough funds to go further than just low carbon orbit. We are still targeting a moon landing, but while we now can afford to front the cash, we still lack the comms capacity to properly attempt the landing. Now we can at the very least afford putting up the next level of our comms network into orbit. Now, the natural choice for a comms network to most is to put up 3 to 4 satellites in Kiel's stationary orbit and call it a day. While this does have many merits, such as always knowing which satellite will be in line of sight on launch and getting decent coverage throughout the Kerbin system, I believe for our current set of requirements we can do better than that with a bit of know-how and patience. Instead of targeting KEO for our next set of satellites, we're aiming for the Mons Lagrange points. A quick note of some importance is of course the fact that KSB does not model Lagrange points, but that minor detail is something we'll let slide. For those not in the know, the Lagrange points are places relative to two massive orbiting bodies, such as Kerbin and the Mun where the net force is acting upon a third, smaller object will in one way or another cancel out in some fashion. Okay, that was a really vague excuse for an explanation. I'll try again. In real life, where we have to deal with n-body physics and everything in the universe with mass is acting upon everything else, you're not going to have perfect orbits as described by Kepler's laws. Instead, orbits are going to be perturbed by the interference of other nearby massive objects. Now, what's interesting is that if in the same orbit as the smaller object, but at a phase angle of 60 degrees ahead or behind of it in its orbit, these perturbations from the larger satellite will stabilize the orbit of the minor satellite. If you get something into orbit at one of these Lagrange points, it's going to stay in orbit for a long time. Again, to actually see this in action, you'd have to play the game with Principia installed, something I'm not hating myself quite enough to attempt. Instead, we'll make pretend that what I'm doing is actually something that, that makes sense to do within the context of the game. So, the question is why put a comm satellite in an even higher orbit than KEO? Well, everything boils down to Delta V in this series, this little adventure included. To have a comm satellite equipped with long range dishes, plus three other parabolic dishes for comms between itself, Kerbin, the Mun, and another satellite, draws a lot of power. 
A lot of power means a lot of battery capacity to keep the satellite online, even when eclipsed by a Kerbin. And batteries weigh a lot, meaning a heavy payload having to go very high, meaning a big, expensive booster to get there. In getting to one of these Lagrange points rather than to KEO, we can significantly cut the Delta V cost by getting a Moonar assist or two. By getting these assists, we can pretty much end up at our destination for a little more Delta V than a Moonar transfer would cost us, about 2300 Delta V that is. Depending on our assist by the month, we're going to need various amounts of corrections afterwards, but these are minor compared to the circularization at a curved stationary orbit. This will all seem like abuse and hijinks involving the patched conics, but it's really nothing compared to what can be done with n-body physics. In reality, things like free captures by the moon through interference from the Earth are possible and have been performed. Such a maneuver is called a ballistic capture and was first performed by the JAXA Heaton spacecraft in 1991. Since that type of maneuver requires the gravitational pulls of multiple bodies to act upon the craft simultaneously, this cannot be done in the patched conics approximation used by stock KSP and will not be attempted here. But for this mission we didn't really have a fixed idea of what we were doing. I knew I could save some delta V through a lunar assist but I didn't know quite how much. For this reason, I brought no less than a thousand spare Delta V to perform corrections post transmunar injection. To afford these margins, the launcher had to be made much bigger than it actually needed to be. This launcher was capable of lifting roughly 10 metric tons into orbit, which is to be compared to the dry mass of our manned missions weighing in at about one third of that. Later on, we'll need to lift both smaller and bigger payloads reliably, and rather than using purpose-built launchers like this one, we'll look into employing standardized launchers for set payload weights. Designing a rocket from start to finish takes me on average about one hour, flight tests included. If we manage to cut out everything but the payload design for each mission, this whole series can progress way more smoothly which is going to be a necessity seeing how quickly I'm cutting my way through my saved up buffer of recorded gameplay. So what was I saying about this mission? All right, we built a big launcher when we really didn't have to. I wanted to have about 1000 Delta V in reserve for corrections, but we shall see that we'll need not nearly that much in actuality. For our transmunar injection, we're going to perform it as we normally would, but instead of targeting a certain periapsis and approach, we're looking at our resulting orbit after leaving the month's SOI. The two important things is that our orbit is boosted so that our perikey is about as high as the orbit of the moon, and also that we don't end up getting flung out of the Kerbin system entirely. Other than that, the details of our capture don't matter much to us. We just want the free boost that Mun is willing to give us. We're then going to perform our transmunar injection burn after plotting it and perform some minor inclination corrections afterwards, which barely warrant a mention since those are such standard procedures in this game. I mean, for efficiency, we should have performed the inclination correction before our exit burn when our orbital velocity was lower, but that's a moot point at these magnitudes. No, let's instead talk about why a Lagrange comm is a good thing to have in preparation for our lunar landings. As you may be familiar with, it's impossible to put a craft in a MUN synchronous orbit in KSP. The SOI of the MUN is too small and the MUN does not rotate fast enough to allow for that. So what do you want to do if uh, you won't need a guaranteed connection above one part of the surface. Well, you put a satellite in orbit around Kerbin with the same semi-major axis as the Mun, of course. Since the Mun is tidally locked with Kerbin, one side of the Moon will always face the planet, while the opposite will face away from it. Thus, it also holds that one side of the Moon will constantly face the posigrade direction of its orbit, and the opposite side will face the retrograde direction. Now, if we've got two satellites 60 degrees ahead and behind of the Moon in the same orbit as the Moon, each with a near 180 degree coverage of the Moon, 
It turns out that these satellites will appear to be synchronous and in view of the moon from all but a 60 degree sliver on the side facing away from the planet Kerbin. This means constant coverage of 5 sixths of the moon, which isn't too bad. Had we dealt in n-body physics, there would be another Lagrange point on the far side of the moon where a third satellite could be placed for 100% coverage with just those three satellites. But lacking that, we'd need at least another two satellites in orbit around the moon for 100% uptime in that sliver. But maybe that's not super essential, since I believe we can get at all but about two biomes on the moon by landing somewhere in our zone of constant coverage. So let's see some orbital mechanics in action. Going by the moon isn't all that exciting on this mission, since we won't pass very close to it, nor bring any experiments along to collect science from. Instead, we're just going to head out to our Apo key, a drift taking the probe several days to complete. Out here, our orbital speed is a negligible 385 meters per second, meaning all of our correctional maneuvers are heavily discounted. Since our perikey is lower than the orbit of the moon, we want to raise it up slightly to either manually circularize at that altitude or perhaps find a cheaper way to correct our orbit. As we perform this correction, we see that we temporarily get a resulting MUN encounter, which gives me an idea. If we already use the MUN to raise our orbit, why not use it again to lower it back to where it needs to be? As such, we plot for a later correction to regain that encounter and make sure that the encounter will bleed off our excess orbital velocity to bring us nearly in phase with the MUN. This is not a maneuver I'd like to calculate by hand, let's say. Remember, I have a hard time explaining a free return trajectory, so if you're unsure what black magic is going on here, just imagine how I unsure I am of how to best explain it to you. I'll still try, of course, more for entertainment purposes rather than actually hoping to get my point across. So, by altering the angle, energy and timing of our second moon encounter, we're going to end up in different elliptical orbits around the moon, each with an apoapsis outside of the sphere of influence, which makes it a flyby. Now, depending on the characteristics of that orbit, we're going to exit the moon's sphere of influence with different velocity vectors, varying in both direction and magnitude. What we're hoping to set up is a mostly radial escape in relation to the moon's orbit around Kerbin, whereby our orbital period will be nearly the same to that of the moon. We still want a slight deviation as to allow us to drift to the Lagrange point 60 degrees ahead of the moon, rather than to be recaptured by the moon on an upcoming orbit. Play this game as much as I do, and you'll be sure to both understand that and be able to explain that better than I do. As you can see, the correction was made, we're gently drifting through the SOI of the moon on what would have been an orbit had the SOI just been a bit bigger, and we're approaching our escape, at this point moving almost straight down toward Kerbin in relation to the moon. The only thing we need to worry about now is that our resulting apoapse is coming up in half an orbit, where we'll be moving slower than the moon, potentially allowing it to recapture us. To correct this, we'll want to lower our apoapsis, but doing so with a retrograde burn is inadvisable this close to the SOI border, since that too could lead to an unintended capture. Instead, we'll perform an anti-radial burn to decrease our orbital eccentricity, taking us into an orbit that's consistently below that of the moon. This will not allow that big lump of rock to catch up with us at any time in our orbit, since our orbital velocity will always remain higher than that of the moon. Of course, a radial burn is not the most efficient thing in the world, but we did bring a lot of spare fuel, and the patched conic system in KSP is notoriously finicky and opaque when you're dealing with low relative velocities. Or high relative velocities, for that matter. Point is, in a situation like this, we're better off playing it safe rather than assuming there will be no encounter just because KSP says there won't be one. 
Now it's just a matter of patiently drifting into place, performing minor corrections as to end up more or less exactly 60 degrees ahead of the man. Yes, mech jeb can be set up to show relative face angles, but we're only really interested in getting this in approximately the right position. We'll be interested in putting up three of these satellites in total. This one ahead of the moon, one behind at the same distance, and finally one on the opposite side of Kerbin relative to the moon to talk to the other two when the KSE is not in direct line of sight with either of the two in view of the moon. They'll all be situated at roughly 120 degrees relative to one another, which gives us loads of leeway for full coverage of Kerbin, so a degree or 10 or de of deviation is not going to be something we will worry too much about. Finally, we want to get rid of the booster stage, mostly for aesthetics rather than for any practical reason. Which is also kind of dumb, since we'll probably almost never look at these satellites past their initial setup. Anyways, we set up a maneuver where we burn retrograde enough to in a few orbits time end up crashing into the moon and perform that maneuver. Note that we are going to overcook it by a couple of delta V. This is because the decoupler will add some impulse to the spent stage, which may otherwise take it off the encounter we just plotted for. Now it's just a matter of boosting the payload back to an orbit with a matching semi-major axis to that of the man using the onboard RCS thrusters. We could have followed that spent stage to see where it ended up crashing, but this mission has already taken us over three weeks of in-game time, in which several new rockets have finished construction. It's probably time to launch them, rather than sit back and watch the fireworks. Finally, to finish off the mission, we're going to christen this first Layer 2 comms relay the Fjallar, one of the three roosters whose crowings would harbinger Ragnarok. Our interpretation is that, just like in the old Norse beliefs, a new world would rise from the ashes of the old one, and rather than foreboding the end of the world, these relays will usher us onto new worlds where no Kerbal or probe has gone before. We may see some of that come to fruition in a very near future. I'll see you guys then.